by falling off. All right, so uh, the session today is a Drupal wet adoption with government. Uh, everyone can hear me fine, I'm assuming. Don't need a mic. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm the managing partner at Open Plus. We're an Ottawa-based company with uh, nationwide clients, primarily working in Canada. 100% uh, of our deployments are Drupal-based. So we don't do WordPress. All we do is Drupal. Uh, and they're mostly public sector, largely public sector. Um, the objective for my session is to share some insight on some of our government projects that we've deployed, um, discuss Drupal wet experiences specifically, um, review some adoptions, uh, technical debt factors, a term I want you all to be familiar with after we're done the session. Um, and we certainly have a mixed audience here, so evidently this session is a business stream, so we're going to keep it at high level. And we have a mix of government, GC, not GC, technical and not, so and then we're going to try to uh, focus on that front. Um, first, the problem with Drupal. A typical way to start a Drupal session, but it's something that we, we see a lot of, and it's important when you're talking about governance. So its strength is definitely also its weakness. So you know, on one hand, there's the big pro. It's open. Uh, it can innovate freely. Um, that's awesome. That's what built Drupal. On the flip side, it's open. So it leaves itself vulnerable to poor code, poor hacks, and governance is sometimes a factor. So um, coding needs to be governed and uh, you know, needs to fall within the realm of Drupal. Uh, it also allows for many preferences. There's no set in stone, for the most part, uh, Drupal uh, best practices, although that's improving. Um, you still need to ask yourself which approach is best, which methodology is best, which CI approach is best. Um, there are pros and caveats, pros and cons to both, and you need to you know, either go through experiences or deal with people who have gone through those experiences so that you don't end up making some of those mistakes. There are a lot of decisions that you need to do when you're building a, uh, a Drupal site, especially one in government. You know, the bar is high in government in Canada. You know, we need to hit multilingual at a level that most other people don't. Even on the west coast in Canada, there's less of that. So right away, that poses a big challenge. You know, just because a tool says it's multilingual and there's a checkbox in the flyer, does not mean it'll properly meet, meet multilingual, especially in a government-mandated approach. Same for accessibility. So you know, decisions range from which modules am I going to use, and that could be 100 plus. Um, again, pros and cons to each one. Uh, is Drupal 8 ready? A lot of people have a tendency to think that Drupal 8 is strictly an evolution of Drupal 7. We sort of see it more as two different products because they're, they're pretty drastically different to a certain extent. So you need to think of it that way as you're uh, biting into big projects. So be mindful of technical debt. I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I've got a few slides on it. Um, so many of our projects are restarts or round two of projects where we're either taking something that's had a, a shortfall coming out of the gates and we've been doing more and more audits for clients and you know we've had several recent examples that we've come across um, you know this is an example of a, of a typical site the 3500 uh, pages you know, simple site but when you look under the hood and you see 214 custom PHP templates 60 custom modules uh, 33 content types and when you see segregated French and EM in the same site for different pieces of the architecture you start to get some red flags. Uh, we've also done audits on Drupal 8 sites that were struggling. Um, and you know, there, there are a lot of developers are very eager to jump into Drupal 8, but if you have a you know, government client, you also have a level of responsibility to factor some of those things and look at it from, is there an upgrade path to this module? Are security updates going to be notified for you? So running alpha modules is something you need to be aware of what that can mean for a project. So there are some red flags that we're seeing on certain projects. Um, it's something that's certainly a factor. So you know, when you're doing a project, you need to think of what that technical debt might be and what, if you're a developer, what that might mean for the client, both now or later. Um, maintainability and sustainability. So if you're just very eager to code a lot, you could be introducing some maintainability factors for your site. Uh, migration. So. You know, you could be impacting the ability to facilitate migration later on. 
content architecture could be compromised. So those are those are things you st always need to be factoring when you're when you're developing a site. And the way we look at things is, you know, code really needs to be warranted. So if your notion of of Drupal is strictly lifting the hood and coding away because you can because it's PHP, then that you know that sometimes can backfire on you. You've got to think about that. So there are some criteria you can go through and, and try to think about that. You know, every line of code is a bit of a weighted liability. It can impact security, can impact updates, um, and you have to ask yourself, you know, why are you doing this? You know, we we've, we've been in meetings with universities where they've showed us some of the stuff they were doing and our reaction is, oh, this already exists. There's a module that does that. So it's sort of a reinventing the wheel process. So you have to sometimes think, am I the first person that's trying to achieve this? And it's unlikely given the magnitude of the Drupal community. Um, so that's, that's certainly one big component to think about. Um, code is certainly applicable. So there are many reasons why you might want to do code, but you need to reason it with yourself and, and make the decision to say, I've got to factor governance and I've got to factor the rest of the community. Um, also, by nature, if you contribute it back, you'll, you'll iron out some of those questions because the community will, will be collaborative with you. So if you're trying to do something and you squirrel it and keep it to yourself, then you're not getting that feedback from the rest of the community. Someone could come back and say, oh, this is actually really similar to this, and maybe you didn't need to fork that module, or maybe if you take this approach or put T-strings around this and, and make sure it's multilingual. Um, I think one of the reasons Drupal Wet did well is a lot of the community was going back to those modules. I keep thinking about accessibility, but a lot of it was just improving the modules, you know, making sure they were multilingual properly, making sure they were WCAG. A lot of people might be developing a module and not thinking about accessibility because it's not mandated for them, so they might not care about it as much. But just going back to source, you know, don't fork all those modules and then try to rewrite them just to fit your own need. Try to go back to the source and fix the original modules. Um, a bit of an example of that real quick is, you know, we've taken over projects where we'll see on the left side, it's someone who's aware of a checkbox. And on the right side is someone that wasn't. So they'll just do some PHP hack to try to do something only because they weren't aware that there was a checkbox. So there's implications to that potentially, right? What are they, what are they doing in PHP? Are they impacting the upgradability of the product, et cetera? Um, so, you know, we're always apprehensive if we see someone who's a great PHP developer who's brand new to Drupal, there's a weighted factor there. You still need to be very oriented with Drupal. Um, we won't solely talk about WET and Drupal WET. You know, there's still an element of Drupal with government, but um, for those of you who don't know what WET is, and of course there's always the WET, WET bow, WET kit, Web Experience Toolkit, it's all the same thing. It is a Government of Canada um, open source code library that helps with accessibility. It's primarily bootstrap with jQuery, um, but we also see it as you know, the, a bit of a rule of governance, right? So there's more to it than just the, the library and the code. It's also the expectation, the expectation that sites will work this way. It's an example set, if you will, of responsive will work properly because that's been ironed out in all of these browsers. Um, multilingual should look like this. So there's also the interoperability, if you will, it's beyond accessibility and multilingual and responsiveness. Um, and Drupal WET is essentially, it's a non-proprietary Drupal distribution. So I say non-proprietary because effectively all it is is a set of modules and a set of configurations that come for you privately. So when we say it's done properly, you know, core is never hacked and neither are the contrib modules. Uh, and we see it as a set of accelerators. So if we're gonna start a project, if it fits within the guidelines of what we think Drupal wet and if we think there's added weight, then we start there and out of the gates, the yardstick is already way ahead. So it's a set of accelerators for us, is how we look at it. It incorporates the wet library in it, but you have to be careful how you define that. So, you know, it's pretty easy to make wet available to anything out there. You could just share the JS libraries and then say it's in your CMS. Um, and some people have attempted that with Drupal, some people have done that with AEM, but we like that it's actually incorporated into Drupal Wet. So what does that mean for us when we say it's incorporated? It means that you know, when you're in your WYSIWYG, your styles will come through, your classes will render, and you can choose them from a style. Your style panes are familiar with some of the bootstrap classes and it'll render the way you would sort of expect. So some of the markup, and it's important if you're thinking of a decentralized um, published so 
If you're not looking to dream weaver your site where everything's going to be HTML and you're passing through everything uh, and you're going to be using the site, then it is important to know that you know the HTML filters are clean. It's going to trim out and get rid of the junk. It's going to remove inline styles and um, it's going to try to make sure that the proper wet classes that are proven to work will be applying in the right areas. And that also helps a lot for upgradability later. I didn't mention it here. Um, the Drupal 7 branch was vetted by Acquia. Uh, so Statistics Canada was commissioned to come in and review the distribution. And they did say it was one of the best distributions that, uh, that they had seen. Um, and as far as D8 goes, some of you probably saw Will's spiel this morning as fast as he was going, of course. But um, it's based off Lightning, which is largely premised with Acquia. So you know, there's some good alignments there. Um, it's currently maintained by the Statistics Canada team and the Open Data team, um, and TBS is getting more and more involved with that, and we're, we'll see where that goes. Um, Will couldn't make the session, and Andrew's not here today, but I thought, always feel it's good to point those two guys out. They've done so much work on the distribution. So, you know, getting started. This, this isn't a demo, but um, there are some pieces in here Will was hoping I was including, and, and here they are. So. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more, you know, call it marketing-wise around Drupal Wet, you know, there are some flyers that we have here. There's DrupalWet.org that has some information there that we try to keep up to date. Um, the projects themselves are off Drupal.org, and that is difficult. You need to follow a protocol to have a distribution hosted on Drupal.org. You can't just, you know, the code is uh, evaluated, and, and you have to sort of qualify to get there. So. One thing that's confusing for some people is there are two different naming conventions for the namespace. So Drupal 7 is in slash WebKit and Drupal 8 is in slash WXT. So I think that's just a decision that they wanted to refine how they were calling the product, no longer WebKit and now Wet. So you actually have to go to a different URL in Drupal whether you want the 8 version or the 7 version. So, you know, D8 is still alpha. You know, be cautious with it. It's on Drupal.org now. We were running it out of, Drup of uh, GitHub repos pre prior, but um, you just run Composer and, and away you go. There are some simple test me links there, and that's probably the simplest, fastest way you can experience those two platforms. So by clicking those links, it'll effectively install the distribution for you remotely. It'll give you a 30-minute window to do whatever you want with it. So it's a fun way to at least experience them. Um, Sorry, as far as hosting goes, we've deployed it on everything. So whether it was shared services or uh, on-premise, we've had to do with clients. We've had to do this with clients also who are completely off the grid and they need to run secure networks. It's nice to have an environment like this where you're able to do that. Um, we've done Amazon Canadian Soil, uh, Azure. Uh, Acquia, I believe, will be launching the first GC site on Canadian Soil in the next uh, few months. Another quick way to get off the, the ground as far as trying the environments, if you will. Uh, it is one of the few recognized distributions by Acquia. So if you're running Dev Desktop, you just click Start from Scratch, and right at the bottom, you get the wet, you click Install, and you'll get a Drupal 7 wet build uh, running for you. If you have an Acquia Cloud subscription, then it's one of the three public sector distributions. So it's pretty easy to get one fired up. Once you've got an install of Drupal wet, this is what you get by default. This is the 7 branch. And it starts with a basic wet site. So for a lot of people, when they think wet or they hear wet, they just think, oh, it's Federal Government of Canada. No, it's, it's you know, the wet library is used by a lot of other people for a lot of other uh, projects, whether they're government or public sector or whatnot. If you've got similar needs where you've got to meet similar thresholds, then you can leverage wet. Wet itself is open source, but so is Drupal wet. So the base theme you get is a sub-theme that's, that's vanilla. So you can modify it yourself. On DrupalWet.org, there are instructions and even a video on how to create a sub-theme. Um, and if you see the leaf on the slide, if you click on that, you can actually choose a few themes right out of the gate. So one of the ones that comes up is Canada, uh, which is what this renders at. So the, the Canada theme is in here by nature and by default. Um, but if you're not the governor of Canada, you don't need to run this theme. Um, this is the Drupal 8 equivalent. So this is just a vanilla install and this is where you land, it's where you get. The only thing we did to this theme, uh, to this install is turn on the Canada theme and we also turned on the CDN, the Content Delivery Network, just to sort of paint a picture. Because everything that's in the top blue menu, all of the menus and the three big boxes on the bottom footers, 
are inherited automatically for whatever happens in AEM from the government of Canada. So that's a, that's a big benefit if someone's looking to, whether you're your own set of, you know, if you have many sites you need to move and you are running a CDM, it's a neat approach. This isn't proprietary to the government of Canada, but it's neat to see that they, that they do it that way. It's a great way to have a common header and a common footer and they don't need to be in your source. So the nice part is if someone goes and edits the Health Canada menu and they do so in AEM or Adobe AM, it propagates to the, the CDM and then it's automatically her inherited to your site. So no one needs to worry about syncing information for headers and footers. This is a new theme. I asked permission to show the screen. So uh, some of you might have seen digital.canada.ca. Uh, the CDS, if you will, that uh, Alex was talking about this morning. So we've got a youth portal that we're developing with them and we're premising some of the new look off that same bootstrap theme that they've done uh, and we're we'll evidently open source and share this theme back to the Drupal 8 community for web. Um, touching base on sort of the top 10, you know, I'm a David Letterman fan, anything top 10 is, is fun for me to, uh, to read, but key benefits of Drupal web. So, evidently, there's there's a notion that it you know meeting accessibility, multilingual responsiveness, um, you know guidelines defined by TBS, and I spell that out because you know multilingual is a big one in there. You know, of course, accessibility, but we've all gotten much better at doing that, and especially even in Drupal 8, you know, by nature it, it helps with accessibility. Uh, but multilingual is one that we see the most failures with. Um, you know, having ac accented characters, uppercases, we still see spaces, percent twenties, uh, even the toggle and not jumping to the proper pages. So even Dries and some of his examples of D8 with Louvre Museum in France would not meet the status quo required for Treasury Board for multilingual. So you know, those are factors that, that we look at. So we often hone in during our audits on multilingual. Um, and responsiveness, you know, same goes. We have, I believe the threshold for TBS, if I remember correctly, is 5% uh, of your browsing analytics. You have to support that browser. At least that was a threshold back then. Um, I'm getting some nods, so I think that's right. Um, so bootstrap and wet theme comes with it. So, you know, that, that's a benefit to know that it's, it's got bootstrap and wet there for you out of the gates. So if you need a Canada.ca theme, then even better, it's there for you. Uh, it comes with workflow, staging, moderation, versioning, and audits, things that in Drupal 7 you don't get. So, you know, Workbench is there, so there is a way to deal with content workflow and moderation that's, that's tested into the environment. Um, so governance, so there are samples, layouts, and content architecture that's there that's good for you to experience, right? If anything, it's a set of templates. These are how the content types are built. Here's how the taxonomies are. Here's how they translate. So it's a good uh, basket of, of seeing how things are built that we know comply. Um, account roles, and it is group ready. So, you know, we've done many Drupal wet deployments where LDAP or Active Directory, we've plugged it in with Domino and inherited all of their roles and users automatically for 15,000 employees at a, at a government department and work with other uh, environments. So, it's, it's certainly proven in that sector. I'm just continuing the list here. So, number six. Um, it's extensively tested. I, I can't say enough about this because, you know, in Drupal 7 there were a lot of decisions that needed to be made and of course same thing applies for, for Drupal 8, but it's nice to know that um, all of those modules used in this uh, use case with this theme, you know goes through unit testing, goes through security testing, has cross-browser testing. So uh, it, it's a shortfall that we see when we do our audits, so we appreciate it even more use Drupal wet, but we also tend to take it easily for granted. Uh, maintenance. So, you know, patches and updates, of course, is, is, is an element to, to, is one way to look at it, but, um, you know, by nature, you don't want to just blindly update modules. Um, it can have side effects to your site. So it's good to know that the Drupal wet team will evolve some of those modules for you and will also evolve the web updates for you. So you can align yourself with the distribution, but you can also decide to maintain it on your own. It's, it's still just Drupal, uh, so you don't need to necessarily, you know, hitch your wagon to that cart, but um, it gives you some flexibilities. Uh, proven integration, as we saw evidently from some of Will's slides this morning. So um, 
this is one of the reasons we chose Drupal is because it's got vested interest to work with as many things as possible. You know, web services, APIs, you tend to just not worry about that. You know it's going to try to adapt and integrate with anything. Um, so we're seeing more and more of that. We've, we've done integrations with um, various databases, uh, Oracle, SAP, Microsoft environments. Sometimes we've leveraged Solar to index remote sources. Will spoke a bit about that this morning around CCAN. But we were doing that with Crown Corporations where we were harvesting four or five other databases and presenting them in Drupal and they look local, but they're not in Drupal. And the benefit of that is you can take an environment that's very expensive or take a legacy environment and then you can harvest it with solar and then present it through Drupal and now you're meeting accessibility. Now you're potentially meeting some of your multilingual components. So it's a front end layer to an environment that can be legacy. Uh, extendable beyond your needs. So that's something that's even come up with, uh, we're working with the uh, Privy Council for the youth portal. Um, and of course, some projects start off with a simple, I need a website, and that's where it starts. But it's always going to evolve, uh, most web environments do. So, you know, later on they might want a survey, they might want a poll, they might want web forms, uh, commenting or social. Well, it's nice to know that at least if you premise your site off of a web content management system like Drupal, well, you'll have a lot of those components. They're there, they evolve when you sleep, even the stuff you didn't think you needed, they'll be available to you. And I wrote features there because that's a lot of how we tend to work. If I know that you as a department is running Drupal Wet and this other department is running Drupal Wet, it's easier for us to take a feature, put in all the modules we want, configuring them, and now it's more interchangeable. So it's easier for the department to say, take my blog, run it on your site, install it as a feature. It's versioned. So I'm running 1.1 of your blog. So the more things are similar, the easier it is to co-develop. You know, co-development is a big, big topic with, uh, with governments. We want to leverage that equity and stop having all of these departments reinvent their own little wheels. Which gives a lot of credit to StatsCan. They could have easily said, hey, we're gonna do Drupal, but we're just gonna do it on our own. And a lot of departments do that. It's hard to contribute, but it's nice to see departments say, let's actually make a distribution, let's try to be open. They tried to do steering committees early on, but that got difficult. It was only them presenting, and we're hoping to get them back off the ground. Um, and the last one, also, incredibly important is bulk scripted migration friendly. So um, I'll talk a little bit about Canada.ca and AEM around bulk migration, but um, it's got a lot of options. There's been several sessions, I think, even here today on options for bulk migration, whether you're using feeds, uh, there's all kinds of approaches. And when you're doing that properly, you can also cleanse content and you're also building up um, technical acumen in some of your scripts. So, you know, we have some migrations where we can help you move from Wet 3 to Wet 4. We know which classes are deprecated. We can try to deal with it on the fly when we're doing a bulk migration process. Uh, we can automatically apply HTML filters and we'll look for certain things and strip that out. So there's some neat things you can do there, but having a really flexible bulk scripted migration tool is the difference between having a potentially successful web renewal initiative and not along with good RFPs, but I'll get into that later. Um, so four boxes that we sort of look at that we know Drupal Wet has worked well for us. Evidently, if you've got a web renewal initiative, if you've got a lot of websites you've got to deploy, or even one, but if you've got a very simple site, Drupal Wet might be overkill, Drupal might even be overkill. So depending on what your bar is, you know, if it's a static site with, you know, brochure site, maybe WordPress is a better option, I'm not entirely sure, but as far as enterprise sites go, we always lean on Drupal, um, and if you've got multi-site, well, Drupal wet, and at the very least, distributions that you can manage yourself, if you've got a lot of sites, is a big consideration. My account apps, so evidently if you've got authenticate and log in, you know, Drupal wet's a good fit, uh, as Drupal is on, it, on its own. Um, online digital services, we'll look at a couple of examples of that, and of course, digital workplace and intranets, where we've got a few projects that we've done um, digital workplaces with, so it's certainly a consideration. Um, so why consider Drupal Wet? Um, evidently for us, and, and if, you, if you followed Alex on Twitter, which is hard to do because he does so much of it, um, you'll see some of the, the, the trends that the government has learned from some of its mistake, and you know, prototyping I think is more and more important now. So they talk about you know, failing forward or small failures, you know, try things or build prototypes. Don't go all in first and hope for the best. 
a little bit like what they did. Um, so we believe Drupal Wet is the best way to prototype almost anything. A, you have access to the tools. You know, I wish I could download GC Docs or even AEM to build from Government of Canada and work with it, but you can't. So having access to the tools is a big piece. So it's nice that in a few minutes I can get a build running and I can meet the CDM from the Government of Canada and I can build my app in it and meet a theme, whether it's Government of Canada or not. But if you are a Government of Canada, then it's like an amplifier of five because if you have to meet wet, it's hard. It's hard to integrate that and really only an open CMS will be able to do that, we believe. Um, so if you need to meet a Canada.ca theme, then it's a huge amplifier to build your prototypes on that. We'll actually look at an example of a project we did like that. Um, so that gets you fast results. You know, you can do something in 30 days instead of six months. Uh, as Joel likes to say, you shave a zero off your budget. I'm probably thinking that as I said it. Um, but that leads to better buy-in and it leads to your pilots. Not unlike the GC Tools example, you, know, you guys were able to do a lot quickly and that gets buy-in, people see results. and it's. Uh, uh, well, everyone gets on the wagon. So it's also future ready. So it's nice to know that, you know, even this morning we saw Will show the like button, which ironically we were struggling with one of the Drupal 8 uh, bills that we wanted to flag. And whoops, okay, we were doing the same thing, didn't even know we should, we got to talk more. So it's just nice to know that as a distribution and as a modular framework like Drupal, you'll inherit a lot of those things if you just go looking for it. Um, even the stuff you didn't think you wanted is there. That's one of the big benefits. And I wanted to point that out because, you know, I've, I've been promoting open source for a long time and now, whoops, .NET's open source. So now I keep hearing that now. Oh, well, .NET's open source too. Well, it is, but it's not exactly the same. It's nice that in Drupal, you have pure play access to the capabilities and the functions, where for .NET, that's not exactly applicable at that same layer. Um, so, you know, a lot of that stuff is still tied to a licensed product somewhere that you need to get to. So it's not, instantly available. So a critical mass of a lot of people using .NET is not the same evaluation as saying a critical mass community of Drupal because there you have the capabilities, you have the tools, you have the requirements and things you can dive into. Um, of course, nice to know that it will be supported and it's proven. So if you put a lot of effort in trying to get WET into Drupal, well, you're going to have to keep evolving that. So there's another technical debt. You're going to have to sustain and keep working at that. So if you know there's another entity doing that for you, all the better. Um, and if you leave wet out of it, at the very least, it's a distribution that you know is tested. I mean, it's had threat risk assessments. It's had increased modules for, for better improved security. It's nice to know that all of that testing has taken place. So, you know, we tend to rely on it. And so do our clients. You know, usually they like to hear and see that Oh, it went through all of this. Just recently, I got an email from Andrew from StatsCan because the Treasury Board was asking, you know, what about cybersecurity? And we're just trying to get them to point to themselves. And I literally got one department to give me a list of everything they had done for security, cybersecurity testing and provided it to Treasury Board to say, well, this is what government is doing. So I'm really just sort of holding their hands in between and making them realize the benefits that they have across, across the table. You know, don't start from scratch. This doesn't imply directly Drupal wet. You could have other distributions. If you're a good sized Drupal shop now, you're probably rarely starting from scratch on your builds. You might be off Panopoly or have your own recipes or you know, there's a lot of ways to not have to do things manually. Um, but on the flip side, if, um, if you're just getting going with Drupal and you've got a tall order, um, you know, that could be a steep learning curve um, and you've got to be you got to be thinking about the, 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 the bigger aspect of the project. So some examples of Drupal wet deployments. I put all of these on the same page because most of you saw it this morning, but this is the uh, open.canada.ca, the open um, by default. The far, far right corner one is interesting because I think when StatsCan launched their site, they wanted to do a bit of an exclamation mark. So it's nice that there's an, actually a user account. You can sign in. You can rate things, and you can comment, and you can control your own dashboard, and you can register for RSS feeds. All things that a typical static site or that you know, AEM sort of was not addressing right away. It was just to show that, hey, a good database-driven content management platform can do a lot of this stuff for you fairly easily. So it was sort of, a uh, again, an exclamation mark to show some of the capabilities that they could come out with. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about this Industry Canada project that we did. Um, 
And you know, it's got its own exclamation mark. To see that in 30 days, we were able to prototype a site, even down to doing the bulk migration of the users, the data, and getting it fired up, hosted, and launched. So that's a, a pretty incredible timeline uh, when you think of uh, government. I wish I had the before pictures, but effectively we were able to fire up a Drupal website, uh, build a custom front end. Again, the headers and footers automatically inherited from uh, the CDM, from the Government of Canada. Uh, authentication from the top, so it's easy for them to create their account. There's an approval process, evidently, to allow them in there. Uh, but this is for uh, scientists who need to put their resumes online. So they go in, create their profile. There's a whole moderation process that's already in Drupal. Um, and once it's published and approved by um, Industry Canada, then we fall into a sort of a search interface. So you see some similarities there from what you maybe saw from the open.canada.ca. But again, the same search API facets are available to us. Now, I don't know that we did, we did next to no code on this. It was understanding the, uh, the architecture of Drupal Web. Um, so, you know, we called it browse profiles instead of search because that's a little bit more what the client wanted. But that's sort of the modern day experience, a big keyword search string with facets on the side so you can sample down on your data set. This was sort of just a, a bit of a mind map of the approval cycle from creating an account to uh, a scientist putting up their profile and getting it approved and then getting it posted. Uh, web renewal initiative. So we'll talk about what that's not Adobe. Um, I guess about a year and a half ago, two years ago already, uh, we started with the province of PEI to do a their own web renewal initiative. So they had around 50 sites, 80,000 pages, and they had around 80 staff members that uh, they needed to train and adopt a new platform. And what I like about PEI is they're, they're a very small province with a lot of the same needs as some of the big provinces. So it was nice to see how they, they had no choice but to leverage things, and they decided to go with Drupal Web. Uh, so we were the lead vendor on there. They had not touched Drupal at all when we were there. We ended up training all of their technical team, and they're pretty much self-sufficient now as they work with projects. So you know, from design to uh, content architecture, uh, this is their primary site now. Um, they've got, you know, all their health site is on there, all of their basic content. Their, uh, they pretty much rewrote a lot of their content, so there wasn't uh, bulk migration involved on in this project. Um, but we're real big fans of good content architecture. So we find that a, a good example of that is when you look at search results. So if you've done a good job with your content architecture, uh, it usually comes through on the search results. So if you've got good facets that can define your types clearly and then your topics come through, um, and even having a search experience where your, your files are in there. So you just search and it's looking inside the PDFs, inside the Word files, looking inside every content type, and then it's all refined on the side. That, for us, is, a, is sort of a good example of a good search experience. And we even had some uh, big competitors from Drupal in Toronto contact us on this and say, how did you guys do this? Because it, you know, it was interesting, and they even had their developers pointing back to this. Actually, their client was pointing back to this, saying, well, it's got to be done. Look, these guys did it. And just a little bit of trickery and some know-how, it was, uh, Solar was behind this as well, or Sage API, I should say. Um, they also moved all of their online services. So, you know, we talk a lot about uh, digital services with government now. It's a big topic with the, with the federal government. But, um, again, they had to leverage a lot in order to achieve this and to put more things online. So there's a bit of a, I know the bottom diagram doesn't necessarily come through, but it, it just shows a lot of the, uh, you know, where, where we were able to put in Google Analytics to um, monitor some key performance indicators, you know, where someone starts a form and then abandons it. Well, that, that's an indicator. That's good for government to know what's happening at which stages along the way. Uh, decision points. So uh, when someone uh, went through and went online to buy something or even pay taxes, it needs to then be uh, sent off to an archival system that they were using. So we needed to map all of that out, and this was just to sort of identify that. But like most governments, they, you know, they had a, uh, a big variance of, of forms that were electronic, forms that were PDFs, 
or just a link that would point them to someone else or just a 1-800 number. And those sort of encompass a lot of the typical uh, gamut of web services. We were able to sort of put all of that together so that it, at least they could go shopping in one area and say, hey, here are all of our online services. It doesn't matter which type it is or the delivery mechanism. Uh, at least they weren't just you know, punted off to other sites. They were all in one area. So you could search for all of the services that were there. You could refine them, filter them, and get extra information. So it's sort of like providing a stub record. Once you found the right service, we would then punt them to a really sophisticated web form that allowed for some interesting uh, variances. Some of the side panels are just to show here that someone could register for notifications. Uh, they had a small feature that says, hey, add a reminder. So I can go to their site and say, hey, on November 12th, send me an email reminding me that I gotta pay my taxes or that I have to do this or that my permit's gonna expire. It's sort of like a self-volunteering approach to uh, as a reminder mechanism. So some neat little features that we were able to do there for some real good value because they're sort of available in Drupal. Um, this sort of paints a picture of some of the forms and processes that they go through. One of the big things we were able to do is say, you know, they had about a thousand services that they had to fulfill. And I want to say that maybe you know, 85% or 90% of that fit into a bucket of six things. And there's a lot of commonality to those six things. So you were either, um, you either had to pay or not pay. It was either a web form or not. So there was a bit of a criteria that when they go and need to put a service online, they were presented with that first screen and saying, I've got to add a service, pick out of one of these six. And when they picked a service, we were using some common templates where you know, the, the metadata for the user is the same. So there's a lot of commonality to uh, a lot of the services online. So you know, there's no need for them to specify, ask for the phone number, ask for the first name. Right? A lot of that stuff was common. So there was a template machinery when they would fire up a service. I think they were saying they were going online with a service in like five minutes. It took them longer when they had to get a payment authorization code to put in there than it was for them to deploy a service online. And there's a lot of variations in there. So whether, um, whether it's a, a table that adds rows like an electrical permit where it's based off volume. So depending how many items you were buying would define the price, we were still able to put some conditional rule logic so they didn't need to know code. They just needed to be trained on some of the rule logic machinery so that they could put their services online. Uh, and then we tied that in with a payment uh, gateway. But they, you know, the other thing that TBS has been talking about and, and with their new CDS initiative is uh, users first, right? So a lot of everything should be governed by, you know, the, the public's need versus, you know, reverse engineering to what the tool can do. Um, but for us, it was really telling that there was a CBC article, I believe it was for a liquor license or a restaurant license, that uh, you know, they, they commended the PI government for removing all their red tape. They were able to get approvals for something that was taken months. Now they were being able to do it in almost a week. A um, couple of other screenshots of other projects we wanted to show. So this uh, is actually the same project. And that's an asset in itself. So on, on the left, we've got the Canadian Transportation Agency. Um, they struggled a little bit deploying their own custom version of WET. Um, and that was a little bit difficult to maintain. So we recently relaunched them on Drupal WET. But the benefit there is, you know, a good sign that you've got a good architecture in your Drupal site is if you toggle the theme and you don't get a white screen of death, okay, that's a checkbox. It's good. It's usually a good, a good indicator. But in this, it was fun because everything we were doing in, in, in the WET3, even though that's actually WET4 markup, the look is sometimes associated to as WET3, we were able to toggle to the new look, look for Canada.ca. So it's literally a toggle to experience a bit of the, of the difference. So that's, that's interesting for the client. They're able to experience it a, a little bit differently with just a click of a button. Uh, and now they're reevaluating what their look and feel is going to be because they're an agency versus department, and I think they're trying to resist the AEM approach right now. Um, another project we've done is official languages. So uh, the closest one to me right now on the left is premised largely off the Canada.ca theme. This is an intranet. It's called Echo. And on the far right, you've got their public site right now. I think that's still on um, with three something, but they're upgrading now. Uh, but both of these are premised off Drupal Wet. They've been running it for a few years now. Um, this is Health Canada's intranet, which we had to remind them they actually had the new look and feel ready. So I think they're still running the older look, but again, a similar benefit. 
they were able to update the wet three look and go to a, a more updated look by just updating the theme. So this is what the, the 15,000 employees will see when they log in. It identifies them uh, automatically. These are all linked to their uh, authentication in the morning when they get into the office. Um, it's got group capabilities uh, and it's got a user dashboard. Um, similar to that is actually NRC. They're actually in the room as well, so they've premised their intranet off something very, very similar. Uh, again, the users can set their dashboard, and I believe there are some components of this that are governed. So a user can say, well, I want to see this on the far side, and maybe I'm in Regina, so I want to see Regina news. But the top is governed by their team, and they can push to them the things that they don't want them to control. And then we have some prototype components that we had worked with some of their team on. Um, municipal level, uh, this is the city of Hamilton, great looking site. You see that they've got their alerts at the top. Um, so we helped consult. We didn't build a theme for this, but this is a Drupal web build. Custom theme over it, deployed, they added alerts. But one thing that was fun with this project is when I mentioned features earlier, which is a really bad name, but it's like an app. It's like an add-on bolt-on app. Because we knew that they were Drupal web, we knew a lot of how their architecture was built. So they needed to build a lobbyist registry application. Um, so effectively, we were able to package up, go to the Acquia Cloud, install it for them, and it just worked because we knew a lot of, you know, we knew that they translated this way. We knew it was entity-based, we knew they used panels. So a lot of similarities in the approach. So it made it more easily to bolt on addition of features and capabilities. So in that lobbyist app, there could be four or five modules, configuration, couple of CSS tweaks to make it what it is, but it was a great example. And if you had several other departments, let's say, that were needing a similar app, then it becomes a good example of co-development and sharing. Environment Canada, some similarities there. This site is not live yet, uh, but very similar to the Industry Canada one, where um, you know they've got partners from around the world that come in and um, track uh, issues around environment. And it's got a lot of interesting capabilities. You can authenticate yourself, select a bunch of documents, export to a CSV. So you can see the benefits of you know what maybe the open data team had done, Drupal wet as a whole, uh, search API, facet API. Those are all things that are giving us the ability to do a lot real fast. A bit of a shift, um, you know, I'm sort of leaving government, but this is United Nations um, commissioned us to deploy Drupal wet on, this is on Azure. Um, so this was for UNESCO, for their equivalent of open data, if you will. So what was fun with this one, again, is we premised it off Drupal wet. Um, there was a lot of uh, custom theme, a need data explorer, some uh, very interesting integrations for visualizations for data. Um, so there were some very neat components to this. And again, it was all through Drupal. Like you see on the bottom, you've got four or five little visual graphs that show indicators. And the screen at the top to the right is Drupal managing that data for you. So, you know, there's a data API integration, but Drupal is still playing a role in facilitating them putting up an indicator and referencing it in their data API. Uh, evidently, search was a big factor for them as well. So we. Uh, we made sure that we had sort of an all-encompassing search results, whether it's data sets, indicators, news pages, documents, all goes into your main search. Another province that seems to be uh, leveraging Drupal wet, uh, this is a project we've done with the Yukon government. Um, this was a learning, a labor market uh, site, um, which effectively pulls feeds. So it actually goes to jobs for Canada Job Bank, it can pull feed from various sources and it re-aggregates that data from RSS sources into a search result. So um, it's pretty neat to be able to do this because again, someone goes to this Yukon site, searches a job bank, and it all it's all coming from remote data sources, but it's like if it's local. You can't even really tell that they're from remote sources. Um, so this is just a light reskin of Drupal wet, but again, we harvested a lot of the known capabilities we could get it out of the build. And we think their main site's moving to Drupal Red, at least that was the intent. Um, this is a new site that we've got on the go, and I wanted to point this one out. We just, just won this project. But what was interesting with them is 
it's, it's nice to see an RFP come out where they're actually asking for a wet compliance CMS. So, you know, we like to see that. We, in the past, we've, we've heard people saying, well, I can't go and ask for Drupal. I've got to ask for a content management system. That's not entirely true. So no different than a government department can go out and say, I need help with SharePoint. They can also say, I need help with Drupal. Um, and in some cases, this is a .gc domain site. This is the, uh, when you go through security at an airport, it's, the, it's this group. Um, they actually went out to Tenor and said, we want a wet compliant CMS. Uh, so we ended up working with that. And of course, they were already on Drupal. Now they'll be moving to Drupal wet. Um, evidently, there were some uh, interesting high security requirements that they had. Uh, and I believe this will be the first Acquia Canadian soil uh, project, um, which I've been told by Acquia that in the next few days um, that the Canadian soil uh, region might become available. But uh, getting contracts like this, I think, has helped pave the way to say, okay, the, you know, AWS finally landed on Canadian soil. It was just a matter of time before Acquia followed suit. Some other Drupal web projects that aren't open plus, everything else before this was, but um, you know, we certainly uh, know that other people are also harvesting um, the environment. So the, the PMO site has moved to Drupal wet. I believe our CMP is, I know it's using wet, I just don't know if it's Drupal wet or if it's just the add-on theme. I think NRC's got some projects in here. Canadian Blood Services, uh, Buy and Sell, uh, some of you might have used that, so that's another Drupal wet site. I wanted to talk a little bit about, again, web renewal initiatives. So, you know, for us, it was a good example and a good starting point. It doesn't mean that it's for everyone, but building a distribution is also difficult. Um, we worked a lot with the University of Ottawa, and at the onset, you know, they learned a lot from the Drupal wet distribution, but they were a big entity. And they had a lot of developers, and they had a good sized team, and they were able to harvest some of the know-how from that and build their own distribution. They had a big requirement themselves, and they have close to a thousand sites. And when you think that you know, federal government of Canada has 1,500 sites, well, they're like a small government in their own right, you know, maybe even arguably a big government. So they decided to build their own distribution. And I believe at the tail end, we were able to port a site over in under two weeks, I believe, we had done a project for some of their institutions. So it's sort of a good example to say, you know, Open Plus was commissioned to come up with the look and feel the theme and you know, through a bit of our, of our know-how from the Drupal Wet distribution, we're able to recommend. But they did a lot of this internally themselves. Um, so now it's pretty easy. They've got a whole site dedicated to all of the online documentation. Here's how you manage your WYSIWYG. Here's your governance. Here's all your online documentation. Here's a request to fire up a Drupal site. You just put in your name and you'll get an email that a site went up. Um, and there's even site copy capabilities if you needed to fire up a site. They've since done their student portal their employee portal, uh, and they also integrated a lot of their black site or communications, um, so there's sort of a header on every site that they do. If there's an alert scenario, then it's going to blast out uh, an alert on all of their media. So when there was the firing of Parliament Hill, they got to use this, uh, and it was remarkably successful. So all of their sites, all of their screens, all of their social networks went dark and alerted everyone to exit campus. Very similar. Um, the PEI government, the examples I showed earlier, um, they were on the news maybe six months ago. They had a, a school have an issue. And again, they made an alert uh, that, you know, there's several criteria. You can say, hey, this is a red alert, it's an emergency, or this is just a notice. You know, there's a water main on Main Street that's, but they were able to send out an emergency alert, and it appeared on all of the pages for all of their sites. Um, so adoption. With government, i um, not going to spend too much time, but I get asked a lot about Web renewal. Um, it's just to point out that it's a big challenge. So anyone who's doing many sites, there is a big information architecture challenge. So there's a lot of good people working on this, and it's a tall order. Uh, so it's not only a technical problem, um, but a lot of people don't realize that Drupal was not factored for the Canada one. It was an Adobe win by default. So it is a direct result of a poor RFP. So I think the government had to make lemonade out of lemons, and uh, it was just a matter of time, we feel. But 
Uh, whenever you put so much energy into a big RFP, not unlike what uh, Alex talked about earlier today, this was a few years in the making. Multiple RFIs, 260 plus questions, calls for cancellation for an It was a mess. And when you only have one qualifying vendor at the end, that's usually a bit of a red sign. If, you know, that, that just shouldn't happen. And in a lot of governments, that's not even deemed a competitive process. Um, Drupal Wet, we know, offers some better government options. It certainly has um, better bulk migration options. We know that for certain. Uh, Adobe actually approached us to try to help with bulk migration, and they gave us the build. It's got a lot of component uses, and it's, it's a very different architecture that we don't even feel lends itself well to HTML for the most part. So we're certainly telling our own clients to say, hold out for AEM. Um, it's, we think that that's got a bit of a shelf life, and I think there'll be more and more Drupal options coming to the table. If you're doing your own web renewal initiatives, whether it's for your own department or your own government, definitely try to hone in on an open platform. A critical mass is a big factor. Um, I don't think there was one AEM certified person in Ottawa when the contract was awarded yet. Um, Work with experts and stay away from proprietary lock-ins. Uh, lock it, it sounds like common sense, but apparently it isn't. Uh, some procurement considerations for Drupal. So a few things that we typically see, I only have a few slides after this. Um, something we typically see is, you know, don't expect one dream resource. So we'll often see this where, you know, we need one Drupal guy and he's got to know everything. Front end, back end, hosting, performance, uh, AI, um, information architecture, theming, you're going to get what you get if you expect that. Um, so usually we've seen some concerns with that. Um, value is definitely important, more so in public sector, I would argue, but rates alone don't mirror value. So we've experienced that with clients, you know, restarts are more expensive than anything else. And when you only look at rates, the government typically TBIPs, it's often a race to the bottom. Or if it's a solution that you're buying, that often will just translate to less time being included in the bid. So sometimes you can just hurt yourself if you're putting out tenders that look like this. Isolated resources can sometimes have um, some problems on learning on the job. Um, so usually a hybrid can work well. So we've seen some good examples of this. Usually if you get a few resources working together or even a few vendors, you'll, you'll get some uh, good opinions. Uh, if you get one person that's working alone, evidently they're going to be a bit isolated. It's not the same to have one person who's, you know, learning on the job sounds like a, a bad term. There's always a learning curve to something, but it's very different than when you're working for a vendor where they've got a bunch of Drupal resources. Even if they're working on site with a client, they're incubated into a space where they learn a lot faster. Um, agile procurement approach. That sort of goes without saying, but just in a matter of time here, I'll jump to the next slide. So some tips on deployments. Start small. I mean, it sounds like, a, you know, you have to review of where you're at. If you're a big university, you can still learn a lot from Drupal Wet or to start doing your own distribution. It's sort of a, 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 road, a road map to try to get to how you can manage things. Um, an agile, iterative approach, again, is something that, how we look at it. So if you're going to prototype, it's a great place to start. Um, your conceptual prototype um, that, you know, can sort of pitch the approach. It's like validating what you're looking to do. So often referred to as like a minimum viable product. Um, so D8 is still very new. So be cautious there that you don't go down a rabbit hole. So uh, you might start up with Drupal 8 and then you've got a lot of little components that aren't uh, known yet, or there's trip modules that aren't yet on Drupal 8, now you're in a bit of a catch-22. Who's going to have to port over that? Is it going to be you? What's the extra weight for that? Certainly Drupal 7 is more mature, and there's a, you know, if I just look at web forms, there's a lot of components that are available in Drupal 7. Drupal 8 web forms is coming along nicely, but there's not as many components there. Um, so those, that's just an example of something to factor, so you might even want to try both streams. Uh, get help. So, you know, even just going to the Open Plus site, there's a chat box. If you hit a roadblock, you can always chat with us online. Uh, we like to give guidance. Um, good content architecture and a good content uh, strategy is key. So, 
you've got to think about some of these big decisions, so it's important to get a vendor that's got some expertise uh, coming out of the gates. Be mindful of technical debt, so every decision you make early on can amplify if you don't want to do a restart. Um, and I think that last bullet is, is interesting as it relates back to the first thing I talked about, is by nature being open amplifies the value of experience in here. So, you know, as a as a client, someone might not look under the hood and evaluate and approve everything. That's the nature of how some things work. But you need to be mindful that you're just giving a lot of rope to someone who's in an open environment. So if you don't have someone on your team that knows Drupal a lot, then you've got to factor that when you're working with a consultant. Um, in the end, it's still just Drupal. So when you're deploying Drupal wet, um, you can certainly learn from it, take pieces from it. Will talked about how a lot of this is now premised off Lightning, which is a vetted Equia uh, distribution, if you will. So you can either start off Lightning, or start off Drupal wet, work your way back. Either way, it's a set of modules. You can turn off what you don't need. A lot of the builds we do with Drupal wet, we still were turning off Panopoly or Panop uh, Panelizer. So there were some components that we would undo because uh, we were uh, spreading out the architecture a little bit more deeply. My last slide, um, we're looking for more talent, more partnerships, so whether you're a consultant or someone looking for a job, please send me your resume. Um, if you need help with a project, shoot me an email. As I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of audits of late. Um, you can email me or send me some any questions you might have, but I think we got a few minutes because no one's come knocking in yet and we got going a bit late, so does anyone have any questions? Yes, regarding uh, uh, D7 versus D8, uh, I, I saw that uh, D8 is in alpha mode. Yes. What's the future of, the, of it? When is going to be beta? So, great question. Yeah. Extremely difficult to answer. Yeah. Um, only because the dependencies are linked to the community. So it's very tough for us because, like I mentioned earlier, it's a natural tendency to think that, oh, it's an upgrade. So first and foremost, you can't upgrade from D7 to D8, some of you know that, but you're also tied to, specifically with Drupal wet, to some of the right contrib modules coming to the table. So I know some of the last hurdles, for example, were, you know, we had a few issues with breadcrumbs. Um, there was a couple of components that, that, that were an issue. So I don't know what their roadmap is as far as saying, okay, we're out of alpha. A lot of that does point back to there's a couple of modules in there that are alpha. And even if those, let's say you clear all of the alpha or beta modules that are Drupal 8 wet, if you start to use it and you're now on a release of all the right modules, as soon as you need one module that it's not ready yet, then you're back into that. So it's a bit of a circle, there, there's a timeline to that. People keep saying, well, Drupal 8's been out for you know, two years now. Yes, but it's dependent on a lot of modules. And keep in mind, a lot of people that don't need to hit government sites at the level we do, they've got a lower bar, so it's a bit easier to transition so to. So most of the websites you showed us are uh, you said. Uh, the youth one, the one that's got the newer look and feel, is Drupal 8 wet. So that's our first Drupal 8 wet build. We've done some simpler Drupal 8 sites that had simpler requirements. Even somewhere, you know, whether it was a small alpha or beta module, it wasn't a big issue, uh, only to get our learning curve up. Uh, but as far as, and, and even in that build, there are a couple of alpha modules in that one. Uh, but we've spoken to the main team. We know exactly which ones. We know that they're Equia modules, so we're less worried about it. And there's a bit of a roadmap for those. So, But we're on the cusp. You know, and I think for almost a year, the open data team says, oh yeah, Drupal 8's coming at uh, three months, and then uh, three extra months. It's been a tough road to get to Drupal 8 for that build, but they're certainly getting there now. Yeah? What would you say in all the site builds that you're doing now, what's the proportion of D7 versus D8 deployments that you're doing? And the reason I ask that is largely, so I'm in the Canada Science and Tech Museum, so we were recently going through that debate, and we didn't want to sort of lock ourselves into a little thing. End of life situation yes. sooner So that's a good question. A lot of our, even some of our, we've got RFPs and proposals that are out there which are still recommending Drupal 7. There's a decision point for each one. So there's the vendor aspect of that. You know, there's a, if an RFP was written in a way that you're just going to say it's a deliverable project and you're holding the liability, 
And all it takes is one feature or one component where, oh, well, there's no module for this yet. In D8, I've got to write it because I've got to port it. I'm on the hook for this. So we know that in D7, it's at least mature. So a lot of the decision factors will be in the number of capabilities or number of requirements that you might have. Uh, we've seen this with uh, the Ontario Legislation Assembly. They're demanding eight. We sort of bowed out just because it was very strongly worded in their proposal. And we know that they're going to have some experiences with that that will put a few sticks in the spokes. But now AQUIA is trying to get us back in to harvest some of that expertise that we know there can be some challenges. That said, the good thing about Drupal Web was a lot of the decisions that were made along the way, they were big, but you know, there's no node translation. It's all entity translations, but that's how it works in 8. It's Workbench. Workbench, now part of Core for 8. Uh, Panelizer, now part of Lightning. So a lot of the decisions that were made collectively for Drupal 7 Web are showing uh, that they're moving over to 7. So uh, Drupal 7 and Drupal 7 Web are pretty different um, in the sense that Drupal 7 Web is much closer to 8. Again, all entity translations, etc. So um, it's an easier port over to go from Drupal 7 Web to D7 Web than it would be from. So I agree with you, it's a bit of an end of life to say, well, I don't want to release on this now. Um, there are some caveats that you have to consider if you're looking at it that way. I think you guys are on open text uh, platform right now, right? I'm not sure. But, right. Yeah, Alex and I actually spoke about that. So there's, um, you know, there's the notion of, of looking at a few phases to say, what would be some, you just have to factor time. So you might be able, you might have to buy time on a couple of those features. But all you have to do is go in with that eyes wide open. Just the fact that you're asking that question puts you in a bit of the driver's seat. You're already, you're ask, asking the right thing. So vendors like us love to hear those types of questions because you're aware as opposed to preaching and saying, no, I want the eight. It's been out for two years. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to do it. No, that's a naive approach. So we would probably come to the table and say, yes, we can do D8. We can still do commenting, still do certain things. But you have to understand that it's either probably more of an agile approach. You know, you do sprints. You're able to knock those off. These four or five last ones, we would recommend you wait the next phase. So if a client is... Um, you know, open-minded that way, then yeah, we'll definitely work with Drupal, uh, Drupal 8. So with, with Treasury Board, we wanted to go Drupal 8, only because we also had the backing for Drupal data. Too. I'm done. So um, I don't know if anyone else had another question, but that's about it for me. There are some brochures here if anyone wanted a little bit more takeaways. It's a bit of a dated version, but 